This is the third time that Jesus predicts his death. Usually in each one of the Gospels, it's three times that he predicts his death in every Gospel. In Mark, we have him the first time when the, him and the disciples are in the region of Caesarea Philippi, he emphasized the necessity that the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem and die. And that was in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. And at that point after that, do you remember what happened? Does anybody remember what happened then? We didn't actually talk about the Mark verse, but I know we talked about one of these verses a little while ago, not too long ago. Peter takes him aside and says... No way. It's not going to happen. I'm not going to allow it to happen, Lord. Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him. That's what happens the first time that Jesus says he has to go to Jerusalem and kill, be killed. This can't happen, Lord, like we said this, this, even, this morning. Steve and I do it. This evening, as the opening dialogue, right? The last line is, forbid it. It can't happen this way, right? We all think that can't possibly be the plan. That's not the way it's supposed to happen. The second time that Jesus predicts his own death is in Mark chapter 9, verse 31. While they're traveling through Galilee, he stresses the certainty. The first time he emphasized the necessity. The second time he stresses the certainty that the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and is going to die. That's in Mark chapter 9, verse 31. And in verse 32 it says, But the disciples did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. So they didn't get it even the second time, but none of them opened their mouth to say, "Um, Excuse me, but can you explain that a little bit to me here? I'm not quite catching what you're saying. I don't completely understand what's going on here. Right? And now, here we are on the road to Jerusalem for the final time. And he describes the fact that he's going in to die in much greater detail. Right? Have any of you ever been facing something that you didn't want to have to do? Have you ever had to do something that you didn't want to do because you knew that it wasn't going to be a fun thing to work through? It wasn't going to be something that was going to be nice to have to complete. You know? Anybody? Right? We anticipate things. And we know that anticipation itself adds to the trial of the thing that we're going to have to do. Right? The anxiety and the stress of knowing what is to come only makes that situation that much more difficult to think about going through with it. Right? Maybe it's talking to someone about something you know that they're not going to like what you have to say. Or maybe it's talking through a process of someone who's dying and not understanding how you're going to deal with that. Or maybe it's going to the doctor and getting a shot. You know, someone that is petrified of getting shots. And when you're petrified of getting shots, when someone comes into the doctor's office and they tell you, well, we have to give you two shots today, what's the first thing that happens? You tense up, and that makes it that much worse. It makes it hurt that much worse, right? So, you know, or maybe you're at the doctor's office to get a physical, and nobody wants to have to do that. Or maybe you're there to run tests, but you don't have any idea what the outcome of those tests is going to be. Right? All of these things... All of these things that we think we know what we're going to get into and we know the final outcome of them, we have no clue what actually is going to happen in that process as we undertake that task to do that. Talking with that person that we have to tell them the thing that we think they don't want to hear may be the easiest thing we'll ever do in our lives. And the test that you have done at the doctor's office may show that you're perfectly fine. Or they may catch something that allows the doctor to cure you before it takes on something that would be even worse. You see, what we have here tonight is the reading of Jesus' third prediction of his death. And he gives us in very clear detail every last thing that's going to happen to him. But he is still bound and determined that he is going to Jerusalem. He knows exactly what he's going to face. 
but he's not turning around to try to run away from it. So what will happen to Jesus, right? He gives us a clear outline in these three verses. He says to the disciples that the Son of Man will go to Jerusalem and he will be handed over. Right? Handed over to the chief priests and to the scribes in Mark chapter 10, verse 33. He says this. And this is a reference to the Sanhedrin or the Supreme Court of the Jews, the High Council, the Jewish High Council. He will be handed over to the Jewish High Council. And they will condemn him. Right? He will be handed over and he will be condemned. He will be condemned to death and delivered to the hands of the Gentile. It says that also in verse 33. And the reason that he's handed over to the Gentiles, who's actually in charge at this point in time? Rome. Right. The Gentiles. The Romans. The Gentiles are in charge. And the Romans are the only ones who had the authority to put someone to death. This is fulfilled as well as him being handed over is fulfilled in Mark chapter 14. He will be mocked. They're going to treat him with contempt and ridicule. They're going to make fun of him. Right? That's in verse 33. And that is also fulfilled in chapter 14 of Mark. He will be spit upon with saliva or phlegm. Let's think about that one not too long because it's pretty disgusting, actually. And this is done out of contempt and anger, right? Mark chapter 10, verse 34, he says this is going to happen. And this, again, is fulfilled in Mark chapter 16. Everything, 14, everything he said so far has happened. Next, he says he, the Son of Man will be flogged. To be flogged is to be whipped or punished severely. And specifically, under the Roman method of flogging, the person was stripped down, tied to a bending post or a pillar, or stretched out on a frame. Meaning it had a, like a, two pieces of wood that went up and one across the top, and you were stretched out on that. And then the flog was what you've probably heard as a cat of nine tails. Do you know what that is? It's an interesting device that we're not going to talk too much about because there are quite a few young children in the audience tonight. But it's a device that not only included leather or possibly chains, but also bones and metal pieces. It was designed to cut flesh. So he was flogged. And this is fulfilled in chapter 15 of the Gospel of Mark. And he will be killed. Right? We all know that the death that followed his mockery and torture happened. And his form of execution was on a cross. And this was fulfilled in Mark chapter 15. But he doesn't stop there, right? He will be handed over. He will be condemned. Mocked, spit upon, flogged and finally killed. But he doesn't stop there, because we all know that's not where the story actually ends. And after three days, he will rise again. He will be resurrected from the dead. This is fulfilled in Mark chapter 16. Right? So what does all of this tell us, this three verses that gives us this chilling story of what is about to happen to Jesus, even though he set his face towards Jerusalem and has no way of turning back? Jesus was headed to Jerusalem with determination. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, And he had set his face towards Jerusalem, which means in in Jesus' day that he was determined and there was nothing that was going to keep him from Jerusalem. Not Peter, not James, not John, not any of the disciples. The only thing that would have kept him from going to Jerusalem would be if God himself came down and said, Wait a minute, the plan has changed. Look at the binding of Isaac where Isaac was taken up the mountain by his father, Abraham, right? Abraham's only son. And the angel came, comes to him and says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice to me your son. So Abraham takes his son, takes him up the mountain, binds him up, puts him on the fire, and just before he's about to sacrifice him, 
The angel says, stop, and there's a ram in the bushes. It's the only thing that would keep Jesus from going to Jerusalem is if something like that were to happen. He was determined that he was going to get there. And as he was on his way, he led the disciples and the followers behind them. And the disciples that followed him, it said in our text tonight, were amazed. Maybe because he seemed so determined to go to Jerusalem. Maybe because they'd known what had happened the last two times that they'd gone to Jerusalem. Maybe they'd know what was going to happen. Or they thought they knew what was going to happen. So they were amazed. And then it says the people who followed behind them. It's not just Jesus and the disciples here. It's a whole gaggle of people coming. The people that followed behind the disciples were afraid. That's what it says in our text. And they were probably afraid because they, like the disciples, knew what had happened the last two times that they went to Jerusalem. And they knew what they expected to see once they got there. And that it wasn't going to be good for any of them. Especially because that they were with Jesus. They were anticipating what was going to happen. And you see, and that to me is the point of this whole text. Jesus didn't have to anticipate anything because he knew clearly without the shadow of a doubt what was going to happen to him. He knew what was going to happen when he went to Jerusalem and yet he went there anywhere, anyway. And why did he go to Jerusalem? Why? Who did he go to Jerusalem for? Who? Thank you, Kurt. Kurt's got it. Anybody else? Who did he go to Jerusalem for? Bruce has got it. Who else? Okay, I see a couple people. He went to Jerusalem for you. If that person sitting next to him in the pew wasn't here, he still would have gone. He went knowing. And imagine what it would be like if you knew... Right? Imagine what it was like for Jesus to go, knowing everything that was to happen to him. He went in Jerusalem knowing that one of the men following with him right now, the one that I'm telling all this to, is going to be the one that's going to hand me over to the Sanhedrin. He's going to hand me over. Then that high council is going to condemn me. They're going to hand me over to the Gentiles. I'm going to be mocked. I'm going to be spit on. I'm going to be flogged. And then I'm going to be killed. Can you possibly imagine the stress, the anxiety, the amount of pressure it put upon him? I think we can because some of the Gospels say after the Monday, Thursday, Passover meal, he went out into the garden and he prayed and while he was praying, he did what? He sweated blood. That's stress right there, people. The amount of pressure upon him is something that we can't even possibly fathom. We don't want to face a trial that we have no idea what's going to happen at the end of it. Yet Jesus knew he was going to his death. And he went there for you. So as we get ready to enter Holy Week, I can ask you to do only one thing. And that is to fix your eyes upon Jesus. And as the author of Hebrews chapter 12 says, to look upon Jesus, who is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And follow his example. If we have our eyes fixed upon Jesus, knowing that no matter what happens, he's always going to be with us. We can always consider him who endured the hostility against him from us so that we may not grow weary and lose heart. Right? As we enter Holy Week, look full on the face of Jesus as he is determined to go to the cross for you. Unfaltering devotion to God's most merciful plan. So don't worry about the outcome of the little things that we worry about every day. Because no matter what we face or where we go, the one who suffered the greatest things in this world 
is walking right beside you all the way.